club in the city. Um, so, but the annexation agreement again is going to be a binding contract with remedies that will uh, ensure that the city has a plan review in both the micro master plan and the individual development phase plans for both compliance with the annexation agreement and then also to provide discretionary comments that we'll take into consideration as we move forward with development. Another one is CU is building in the floodplain. Well, that's just not true. Uh, if I go back to this map here on the previous page, uh, this is the developable area, this entirety right here. This is the 129 acres, and none of that exists in even the 500-year floodplain today. Um, and it, the plan is, is to be delivered, and what if there is any construction that puts this area in any of the floodplain, that that's mitigated through fill. So the one of the other things that's been circulating out in the community is that we are forcing the city to pay to make our land developable. The real truth about that is, is that we are actually, that's a cost of restoration. This is the area where the fill would be, and this area is currently out of the 500 year floodplain. What puts it into the floodplain is the construction of the flood project. So we review that as a cost of restoring the existing condition to that property. Another one is why not a land swap? And this isn't so much a misconception, it's just a question in the community. Um, and a couple of years ago, we actually uh, agreed to explore a land swap, but quickly realized that it was a very long process that did not, did not track with uh, certainly the prudent and responsible delivery of flood mitigation. Uh, and our understanding is that that, the, that area becoming even considerate, considered for annexation is no sooner than 2027. And so it just, it's, it's not on the table. It just does not align with the timelines for this project. And then finally, CE refuses to provide a site plan. Uh, well, that's, we're not refusing to provide a site plan. We can't provide something we don't have. Uh, this annexation was really precipitated by the city's wish to develop flood mitigation on this property. And we were in conversations back before the guiding principles were developed. And in that, what we did, what was determined is the city wanted to annex the land we want to annex the entire site. And so we agreed to apply for annexation to facilitate the timely development of uh, flood mitigation. So it's not something we're not annexing at this point. We didn't even approach the city to annex because we have any plan for development. Uh, that is really, a, we have no plans today. Uh, so there really is nothing that we can provide. And those are just some of the common misconceptions floating out there. And uh, that's the end of our presentation. Happy to take questions on anything that we've talked about. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Um, well, a, a bit of a bridge um, on one of the topics that you uh, raised. Um, in the chat, um, our Fred Edburn raised the possibility of a gondola. Ed, do you want to ask a little bit more about that? Uh, you know, I don't know if it's a gondola or a fixed guideway, but the idea of using the 36 corridor to move people back and forth and in a way that captures, could capture commuters from out of town as well. Uh, you know, finding a, a place at the edge of town where we can get people out of their cars and onto a system that would develop over the next 50 years that might allow for a, a more efficient way of moving people from place to place. And the good news is the ski industry's already, already figured out how to do this. And uh, the right of ways exist and it's in the right location to move people from this CU South site to campus and uh, maybe even connect from the conference center down to downtown. I mean, there's, wanted to be sure that it got asked. Ed, in all transparency, I've already shared your comment with our transportation staff. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we, we've, I think we've identified some things around, you know, potential opportunities for future planning. And the, I think the town and gown aspects of the city university relationship, we've, we've done that in the past successfully and, and would look at a further opportunities for that. And when you look at the cost of, I mean, the real cost of buses is the drivers, their salaries and benefits, uh, and the fact that it's still in the mix of our other vehicles. So th this might be a win-win. Thanks, Thanks for thinking about it. Um, now we'll go to Mark Latos from Cigna. Mark? Mark? 
Mark has a question about um, what would be the impact of not doing flood mitigation? What property and population is at risk from flooding with the status quo? I was double muted and I apologize, but you, you captured the question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I, I can take the answer to that one. And uh, uh, many of you uh, have probably seen presentations that we've done at city council and what happens without any flood mitigation, what happened in 2013, um, when, when a flood comes, South Boulder Creek uh, overtops its banks and, and fills up the valley and then um, eventually it, it goes over US 36, just west of the Table Mesa park and ride and floods the, what we call the West Valley, a neighborhood in that area. And <clears throat> I don't have the presentation with, the, with all the details, but I'm remembering uh, 1100 structures that are uh, impacted in a hundred year flood and uh, 2,300 people, I believe. And as we talk here, I can go back to my presentations and make sure I've got those numbers right. But that's that's kind of the scale of the impact that we're talking about. We're also going through a master plan update for our flood and stormwater utility. And over the next two years, hope to come up with an updated way of prioritizing projects across the city. And uh, however the priorities come out um, and whatever mechanism we come up with, this project uh, has, has the impact of helping a lot of people and also keeping US 36 moving during a flood. Um, so it'll come out high regardless of how we come up with the prioritization process. Thanks, Joe, and thanks, Mark. Adrian. <clears throat> Sorry, did you say me? Yes, okay. thank you. Um, I'm a little concerned in the way that um, the, uh, the property is, is being proposed to be actually separated from adjacent neighborhoods when that is completely against city planning guidelines. And I'm wondering, is this project going to have to go through site review process? through the city? And is there any kind of memorandum of understanding between the city and the university relative to a minimum amount of allowable construction, density, square footage, whatever? The reason I ask is having been through this kind of review cycle many times, neighbors can make that very difficult. And I'm wondering what kind of agreements the city is going to make with the university to allow something to happen here after you go through this process. I'd be happy to start, Derek, and feel free to, to weigh in if you'd like. As a state entity, the university is not generally bound by our Title IX development restrictions. And so unless it's in the annexation agreement itself, um, it wouldn't necessarily apply to this site unless the university chooses to, to do that. Um, the process, the university would go through its normal development review process um, in, from master planning to construction plans. Um, and we are in agreement that the city will have a formal um, point in the process by which we'll have an opportunity to review and comment on the plans, future plans, not necessarily veto them. And so it would look like a compliance check. So are the buildings too tall? Um, or, or what about wetland setbacks and things like that? But, but we're also baking into the agreement a opportunity for discretionary comments. And so in 10 years, we don't know what the priorities are going to be necessarily for the city. And so the university um, has agreed to um, take those with weight in, in the future and respond if unable to address them. Um, there are Title IX requirements that will likely be in the annexation agreement, like building height limits and things like that. Um, but there won't be a site review process that you typically see. Yeah, I would I would add to that that is, uh, Phil is absolutely right. The annexation agreement will contain development standards that will apply to the site. Those standards are not going to mimic the Title IX requirements. Uh, they're going to be constrained, and it's a negotiated outcome. That, and that's why we're taking very great care right now to negotiate those because we're negotiating uh, guidelines that will apply for decades. 
and we don't know what the future of, of facilities will be like on this site. Uh, and as a matter of fact, we don't even know what we're going to build on the site today again. So developing those in a way that, uh, like for instance, establishing a height limit, but the university will retain discretion as to delivering uh, any facilities that are within the guidelines that are appear in the annexation agreement. And so it, uh, that's, Adrian, I think that gets at your question, which is how will we maintain the flexibility to build in the future? It's that the, the guidelines are limiting compared to what the university usually has to abide by, um, but they're not so limiting that they don't have flexibility for us to adapt and adjust to future changes in how a residential product is delivered, how uh, any academic uh, and any other, any other uses that are allowed on the site. Thank you, Derek. I would just add, you know, looking at the site plan as it's minimally developed, stitching this neighborhood back into the community, it's not happening right now. And I, and I think that the city really needs to consider their, their overriding policies and apply it to how these neighborhoods connect, because I don't see it happening right now. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, Bill, another mobility question? Yeah, hi everybody. I'm gonna put on my hat as a former transportation advisory board person. Um, I, I, you know, um, one of the things that I'm obviously very, very interested in is the fact that, you know, the state of Colorado coupled with car manufacturers all around the country have already openly committed to fully transitioning away from internal combustion cars to EVs. And so I'm wondering if there's been any discussion, especially in a play to appeal to transportation advocates, climate advocates, progressive advocates, uh, are, are, is there a discussion around including EV charging slots uh, throughout your parking lots? Yeah, I can answer that one. So uh, we haven't had the discussion out here specifically, but what I can tell you is the campus, um, so part of the organization of, that reports up under me it involves parking and our parking organization is currently evaluating a, a pretty large scale expansion of EV uh, charging stations around the campus. And that is naturally is gonna uh, flow over into this site and we'll probably be more prominent here because right now we don't have sure. a horizon for development. Um, but certainly that will be a core part of it and it's certainly align with the campus ethos around uh, the impacts that we can do to mitigate climate change. So Great. that you. will be considered up here. Thanks, Derek. Rachel, a question about housing? Yes, yeah, so what I'm hearing is that there's right now a site plan uh, for what areas are going to be designated for what and what's going to be donated, et cetera. And so there are three potential zones, and please correct me if I'm not understanding this, that are potential residential areas for housing. I um, have lived on this area. I'm one of the neighbors. Um, I've lived on three different sides of this property um, for the last 10 years or so. And my neighbors are livid about it that everyone is very upset because they're, they don't feel like they're getting enough information. And um, I have been trying to quell misinformation because I agree with a lot of people on this call that there have been a lot of rumors and things that have been said that I, that I know are not true. But I think the concern about what was raised earlier about there hasn't been a site plan is bringing all these people, an unknown number of people to be living on this property in an undefined type of housing um, that's, that's, I think, the key concern. And so am I understanding it correctly that there is a site plan for what is going to be where, but there is no site plan for what is going to be built there? I mean, that, and I think it's been said several times, but I want to make sure that that's, that that is the understanding. So we don't know if it's going to be a five-story high rise, you know, something like Williams Village. Um, we don't know what is going to go where, who's going to be there specifically, and do we have? Is there a timeline for when that will be known? Because as I'm understanding it, any restrictions that would be replaced and would be would be placed on the university and what gets built has to be happen now. Because after this gets approved, the university can build whatever they want. Because that's that's kind of what I'm hearing, and I've heard this from the community, and I want to make sure that I understand it correctly. So I apologize if everyone else understands this, but I don't. So please help me. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, thank you, Rachel. Um, so, yeah, I guess I would start by saying it. I would. I don't know if I would characterize the, what we see as a site plan, what we've shown. 
what it does is it shows different areas, but it does, I think the different areas are shown. I'm going to pull them that map back out so I can speak to it while I talk. I think that'll be helpful. So can everyone see this? Yep. So um, this is really, so we have development area, development area. This limited impact zone here is actually a development area, but it highlights that within this area are wetlands and steep slopes that are uh, have will have limited development, right? So if we develop over any wetlands here, then we're subject to the city's wetlands mitigation ordinance or at least provisions that'll be consistent with that. To speak to somewhat, we do, so we don't have a plan of what will go where. That doesn't appear today. So we can't tell you exactly where a residential building will be or even where they might be clustered. That'll be uh, determined in the future whenever we develop a micro master plan for the site. And that'll be once we're ready to start developing on the site, which again is a number of years in the future. Um, but what this does, what the annexation agreement will contemplate and what this map does show is this area of limited development right here is an area where, where there's two things we're, we're doing with this and they kind of work in conjunction. One, we have an overall height limit across the site of 55 feet. And that's measured in accordance with the city's measurement standards, but the, the limit will be 55 feet. That's the tallest we can build. Now, what happens here, there's also a guiding principle that talks about that the development should blend in with the adjacent neighborhoods and not stick out. So here we have a limited development area right here. And one of the concepts that's gonna appear in the annexation agreement is the concept of a height ceiling that will establish a plane across the site that is at about the equivalent height of a two-story house right here in Highview Meadows. And so from there, that plane, if you could imagine st sitting across the, across the site, no matter what the height limit is, if up here, that would be about two stories. So it will limit buildings in this area to shorter buildings. And also we'll look at probably spreading out those a bit because we'll want to preserve some view corridors in that area as well. So there's a number of things we'll look at so that this, so that the neighbor, adjacent neighborhood doesn't have a five-story building or a wall of five-story buildings behind them, right? They're gonna have buildings that are commensurate in height with what is existing in those adjacent neighborhoods. Um, the height ceiling then works down. And so as up here, we'll have the shorter buildings in, in the adjacent neighborhoods and even the taller buildings up to 55 feet will end up down in this area uh, where they will be well under both the height ceiling, um, well, well under the height ceiling about, I think the height ceiling down in the basin area is, is about 100 feet. So again, the height ceiling cuts off the height to the west and gets, allows taller buildings as you move to the east. And I think that answered most of your questions. If I didn't hit one, please remind me, I'd be happy to address it. And so just to make sure, you know, there will not be any definites about, other than the height requirements about how big square footage number of residents that are gonna go into the annexation. Like we don't, we won't get any details that will be forthcoming after it's approved. Yeah, what we have now, and this was done from some very preliminary studies that were, have been used to determine, uh, you know, the, the scope of a traffic study and those things is, and it comes from the guiding principles, is that we've, we've had this target of around 1,100 units, and that's been determined for, uh, again, since the guiding principles, it appears in there, and that's the number that we have uh, used as an uh, approximate. Now, it could be a little bit more, it could be a little bit less. We don't know what we're developed out there. And as a matter of fact, we don't know the mix yet of the types of housing, right? So there could be uh, typical multifamily type structures, uh, apartment buildings, um, but there are also other guiding principles that talk about that those need to be in a clustered village design, pedestrian scaled. So those start to, those concepts start to um, limit the massing a bit of the, of the building. So you're not gonna see these big, large buildings out here. These, uh, you're gonna see buildings that are more, again, pedestrian scaled. And we want that. We want an inviting community with green spaces interspersed, uh, buildings that aren't just stick out like a sore thumb. And I think that if, if one were to look at our other campuses, and there's probably a couple of exceptions, but not many, if we put a lot of emphasis and care and, and uh, diligence into our design, and we care about our aesthetics, the, the aesthetics of the CU Boulder campus are actually part of our brand identity. So it is foremost on our mind. And we will take, apply those principles across this side as well. Um, it, the other, I started to talk about different residential types. Um, you know, we don't, there could be single family out here. There could be townhomes, condos, all kinds of things. We just don't know yet. Once we get closer to that development, we'll start to sort out what the best product is, what is, what meets the needs of our community, what is desired by our community and what's marketable. 
and those will help guide what's ultimately developed out here, but they will all be within the constraints that, that will live in the annexation agreement. Yeah, and I want to add that, that those constraints that Derek has been talking about that we're in, in constant conversation about, you know, we view those as binding. So even though we don't have a specific plan right now, that's why we're in this process to make sure that we have uh, an, a joint understanding and that we adhere to those agreements. And I did see a question in the chat about Willville, and I think it's important to say that this will not be a, a Willville, right? Not to the scale of that. That's a, a smaller piece of land with predominantly undergraduate housing, some graduate housing, more units. Uh, this is a, a really different uh, use envisioned for the campus, for our faculty staff and our upper division students. Thanks, Derek and Abby. Um, Brian Copham has a, another question about kind of background of, of the, um, the property. Brian? Yeah, thank you, Lori. I think these two will be relatively easy. The first question is, when was the property originally purchased by CU? And whether at that time, I, I think common sense would suggest you purchase it because you intend to use it. but was there anything beyond common sense indicated to the community that you know at some point in the future this will likely be developed the, the I'll, I'll jump in on this one the property was was purchased in 1996 uh, with the intention of it being a future land bank but we didn't have any specific development when the property was purchased okay thank you ted um Hi, everybody. Thank you for the presentations. Um, there's been so much insane information around this flying around. This is really helpful to help um, kind of guide thinking and planning ahead and talking to community, community members about this. Um, I happen to live in a neighborhood that's near here. I don't border it directly, but I can walk there very quickly. Um, and so I know it relatively well. I do know that a transportation study was done to, or a traffic study was done uh, specific to Table Mesa. And I'm wondering if you could talk briefly about um, what that traffic study showed. And in particular, it feels like there's some odd intersections, both at the Table Mesa side, the north side of the property, but then also on 93. That's an odd section of the city. You know, it's a hill that goes down and curves and the, the speed limit goes up. I think that I've heard some concern around both of those areas and whether Table Mesa can handle additional traffic. And then also that odd intersection in the south portion of the land and, and what, what all uh, is being done to plan ahead for that and what we can tell our community members about that. Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you, Ted. Uh, so the traffic study really, it, it identified different points around the site uh, and different intersections to, to measure traffic flow. And it took a baseline. It, it had to, most of the traffic uh, study data they used to project future traffic came from 2019 because COVID had a big impact. There were, I believe, uh, if I recall this correctly, about a handful of intersections. And I think it was somewhere between five and eight intersections out of about 60 something intersections that did not have data from previous data. And so what, uh, what our uh, Bill Fox, our study consultant did is actually uh, take tw COVID numbers, but then create an, uh, an adjustment up so that he could replicate what would have been what it would have been if they, we had measurements prior. And so it was a bit of an, an estimate, but it was done with uh, certainly in accordance with standards that he uses as a professional engineer. The specific inter intersections you're talking about at Table Mesa, one of the study did identify um, a certain number of trips to be developed over a, a, a course of about 20 years. And that study, that the draft study had a number of about 7,000 trips. And what the revised study is gonna go do is take both comments from the city, comments from the public, and that is, the, by the way, the revised study is underway right now. It's gonna incorporate those uh, revisions and come up with a final study that'll come up with some recommendations. Um, now to the two specific intersections, a couple of other things that the study did was identify Table Mesa and certain improvements that could go there. One of which was create putting a a light that would appear at the the on ramp from Table Mesa onto northbound 36, um, and so that's something that if the I think the final study will show the same thing, and that's something as soon as we hit a certain number of trips, and that starts to the impact of that starts to be felt, CU will make that investment to do that, and that will help because what what the study identified is a longer queuing lane 
uh, or a longer queuing uh, that could occur there if it wasn't regulated. Uh, with respect to the 93 uh, potential uh, egress and ingress for this site, uh, we have had a preliminary conversation with CDOT and the city, and I know that CDOT didn't express that they thought that this was dangerous, um, that that intersection was dangerous, despite what a lot of the public thinks. And I've driven that intersection, I could see how the perception might be that way. And I, I, I believe um, the city also sees that as not necessarily a dangerous intersection. I'll let Phil confirm that or, or deny it, but um, I, so I think that, and Bill certainly has it from his professional judgment, has it indicated that he believes that's a danger to the for the improvements that are recommended at that in, entrance and uh, the 93 entrance. So I think I hit your questions and again, if I didn't again, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just to note, Rosie did um, put a link in the chat um, for additional uh, background information. Laura, do you have a question? <clears throat> Hi, folks. My name is Laura. I'm with South Boulder Creek Action Group. I want to thank you for this excellent presentation. Um, this has been interesting. I've been following this for years, and I'm hearing new information today. So I, I think it's fantastic. And then my question is about the misinformation that some other folks have mentioned this afternoon. We know that there's a lot of it flying around. And I'm wondering um, what the plan would be to push back against that and really help ensure that the community is receiving correct information to be able to respond to. It's been a challenge, um, especially with a project this complex with so many moving parts. But some of the things that we spend a bit of time on is that our city council does receive quite a bit of correspondence around this via email. So we have a lot of stock emails going back with kind of FAQs clarifying some of the things that we're hearing that aren't necessarily accurate. Um, and then we're also in discussions with our communication department, um, especially as we're um, releasing the actual agreement in the next month or so, um, we'll want some communication around what's in the agreement, what's not in the agreement. And that might be done through a, a myriad of things such as uh, social media, um, uh, newspaper and so on. Yeah, and I'll just start. I, I don't know if Phil's done there. Hopefully he is. I love, I love the Zoom world. I hope that our kids keep showing up uh, in all of our meetings in real life. Um, I'll just add that from C's perspective, you know, we, we recognize there's a lot of misinformation out there. It's why we're really thankful to have the opportunity to participate in events like this. As, as Phil outlined, we just went through a whole series of uh, community briefings. And we really want to get the word out about what we think uh, is actually happening. So uh, thanks for having us here and have the opportunity. And I would also ask all of you uh, to share information. Uh, you, you have the briefing book, you have other resources. We're always happy to provide additional information, but you know, we're happy to talk to constituents uh, and, and share with them what, what our intentions are and what our plans are. And we've had, in my view, really productive uh, conversations with the city about how we can partner on some of those efforts. You know, Phil mentioned they're talking to their communications team. We have a communications team who, uh, over the last year, have gotten really tight uh, because of, of COVID and other things. So I think we'll we'll build on that and identify some opportunities to work together to try to combat some of that misinformation. But uh, I really appreciate all of you being here and and would ask you to uh, also help share the information you're learning about today. So thanks. Thanks, Abby. Um, Allison, did you have a question? I do. Hi. Um, well, I just, you know, I've been um, someone who's a huge proponent of having this development happen, have the flood, the flood mitigation, um, real believer that we have a, a severe housing crisis in our community. Um, and this is part of resolving it. Um, but I guess what I heard, which was sort of interesting for me today, was as Derek was talking in particular, I think, and talking about, you know, all the things that we can't really commit to now. Um, I just, my background is in urban planning, so I, I get it. Um, but <laughs> the Boulder world is, is a special place. Um, I'm just wondering if you can help us understand why is it just a timeline thing that CU doesn't plan to develop for a while. So that's why they don't want to say we're going to build X number of units for these particular populations, because I think that is really like if I had to get to the core of what 
I think a lot of a lot of it is misinformation, but some of it's just a lack of trust mm -hmm. where um, folks feel like, well, we're going to have this, but really right. CU doesn't have to abide by all these city regulations and they can just do whatever they want. So I think that would be a helpful piece of information for me to understand um, and maybe others as well, why you can't tell us exactly how many units and exactly what they'll be used for. Yeah, um, thank you, Allison, for that question. Uh, the short answer is, is that annexation is not on the on our development timeline for housing. Um, it is it, it's completely disconnected and has been since it was since its inception. Uh, it is it is focused and absolutely tied to the need to deliver flood mitigation. And so, given that, we were uh, to facilitate this uh, the the availability of that land for flood mitigation. The, we want the entire site annexed, but if we again that timeline is disconnected. We we weren't we didn't have plans. We didn't desire annexation right off the bat to start to develop anything. As a matter of fact, we're just finishing up our master plan that identifies places on the main campus where we'll be uh, redeveloping some student housing. And there's certain a number of projects that are on our other campuses that will occur before anything happens here. And so that's uh, that's. I think that answers your question, but it just wasn't something, there was no driver, there's no uh, need or driver for us to develop out here that is uh, associated with our current efforts for annexation. They're all about delivering flood mitigation in a timely manner. Yeah, and, and I do just want to reiterate, I know it's been said before, but we, you know, we have made com commitments uh, through the guiding principles around number of units and uh, limitations on on design commitments there. So you know what we need to do, I think, is is do a better job of of sharing those commitments that have been made that we've worked with the city on, uh, so people understand what we can commit to at this point. And again, it is we view it as binding. So the agreements we come to on those those parameters are, are binding for us. So and it might just be. I mean, oh, sorry, it's not really. Much, but I I would. I guess I would just, again, somebody who's like, wants to see this happen. And even I was like, ooh, guiding principles. Like that just doesn't, um, so just the semantics about how it, how we talk about it and how committed we are, or, or you know, the university is to, about, I think we'll go a long way. Um, so just, yeah. I think That's maybe really, really the, the more, the more strongly you can talk about it, it mm -hmm. will help. And Allison, I, I have a question about what you just said, because I think it's important to understand what your perspective is on this. When I heard you mention the guiding principles, is that is that confused with what will be in a binding annexation agreement? Does, does guiding principles communicate something? I'm curious as to what, uh, what that communicates, because we want to have the messaging be most effective. Uh, so I'm curious about what that means to you and how you interpret that. I, there are a lot of people on this call. Um, but yeah, to me, guiding principles are things that, that that's, it's not the same as anything binding. That to me sounds like that's what we sort of mean to do. It does not carry a whole lot of it. That's the first time I've heard, you know, people talking about these as guiding principles. I think the more strongly worded that is, uh, you know, in terms of the number of units. And that was my question was about Williams Village, because this is a lot smaller than Willville. But I feel like people in the neighborhood, and I, I also live in South Boulder, have a perception that, you know, CU could decide tomorrow that actually some some high rises would be awesome here and let's put those in. Um, so I think that it's just a, yeah, I don't, to me, guiding principles doesn't sound as the same as anything binding. Thank, thank you for that. That's really, that's really um, helpful for us because the, the guiding principles played a certain role in this, but really that role has evolved to become a, a binding annexation agreement. And so that, but what your comment has let me know is that we need to shift our focus to just talk about the agreement and no longer the guiding principles. Thank you. Our goal to this point was to kind of translate those guiding principles into enforceable terms. And so where they say, you know, no large academic buildings like the East Campus, we now need to say square footage wise, what does that mean? And so just, just an example. Thank you. Rachel. Yeah, and I'm, I apologize. Please, everyone else raise your hand if you've got questions. I don't want to spend too much time. Um, so I think that was very key, this last bit of conversation about things are gonna go into the annexation agreement. That's gonna be circulated. People can see a copy of it. Like my neighbors do not know this. And this is something that I think messaging could be improved about. Um, and I think 
to the extent so you can make more granular commitments that will go a long way to getting community support in the really close neighborhoods because when they can visualize okay these are going to be probably single family houses duplexes it's not going to be willville that's built right behind blocking all of the views that people have had for 50 years you know so i think that th this is really important and it's it's information i have not seen elsewhere and so thank you so much for that clarification Thank you, Rachel. Um, Rosie, did you have a comment? Yeah, can you hear me? Am I on? Yep. Yeah, I was just, um, I guess I watched the, I also live in South Boulder and Table Mesa and walk my dog there all the time. And um, from what I've heard, I, I support the annexation and I have gotten postcards with a lot of misinformation on them too. And um, so I've been doing a lot of research and that's where I found that link I posted earlier and I attended in December. There was a briefing about the project where I heard, I think it's Fran Draper, is that? Anyway, she said, mentioned something about a 10 year master plan cycle. And that the reason all these details aren't known yet is that CU hasn't developed that next 10 year master plan. but. Don't take it from me. I think all of that is on the city website or on YouTube or something where you can watch that video yourself and hear what she says about that cycle. But I think that's why the details might seem fuzzy and, but, and misinformation is kind of being spread around. It's just because yeah. it hasn't been planned yet. We do. So as a, the, a state university, we do have a requirement for a master planning process every 10 years. It's a statutory requirement. And we actually started the planning process before uh, the application for annexation for this current round. So there's actually good information about it uh, on our website. So CU South is not included because it's not annexed yet. Uh, but our intention is to develop a CU South sort of micro master plan when we are at the point that we're ready to develop. But, but you are correct, uh, Rosie, that there is a 10 year campus master plan, uh, but CU South is not envisioned in it because we're finishing it right now and it's not in next yet, so. Thanks, Abby. Um, and I would ask for final questions at this point, Ted. This is more a comment with maybe a question at the end of it. Um, you know, I know that CU and the city work together on all sorts of things. This seems like a really unique partnership and there seems to have been some really great progress, particularly in the last year, year and a half or so on this. And I wonder if highlighting that wouldn't be um, an advantage um, to help illustrate that this isn't just about CU doing something, this is about addressing a need that the city has, an urgent need uh, for flood mitigation. And at the same time, um, it marks a, a unique partnership. Um, it's it's one that CU and the city are engaged in, in its both of their lifespans. Um, but having said that, this particular project, it feels like there's some really unique stuff happening here as far as collaboration. And it may make sense to highlight something like that to help people understand it's not just one side bullying another or something like that. Thanks, Ted. That's great feedback. Really appreciate that. Wonderful. Well, this has been a terrific discussion this afternoon. Um, I don't see um, additional comments or questions in the chat or raised hands. So with this, um, we'll wind down our program. So um, as we wrap up, I want to thank our panelists providing um, just critical information. Derek, Abby, Phil, Joe, we so appreciate your taking time with us this afternoon to help us understand what's a really complicated issue and it's so important to the community. Um, I did want to note that we can send slides out to the attendees. And so um, we'll do follow up on that. And again, I wanna thank our, um, our sponsors, WW Reynolds and Google for their support that makes um, events like this possible. Uh, before we wrap up, I wanna turn the program to our president and CEO, John Tayer for final comments. Yeah, and I'll be brief. Um, and it's actually Ted's comments of collaboration 
I think, uh, are a great launching pad. Uh, you know, this we're as the Boulder Chamber in a unique position with respect to this issue. And um, the the first position is one that we've already taken as a policy uh, group, but also the Chamber Board, and that is to, we want to support this annexation. Um, of course, we're down to the nitty gritty here, and um, with all of our partners, CU the city, um, even the surrounding neighborhood, we're working through some complex issues. Um, but I just have to hand it to the city partners and the university for working constructively through these issues. And um, the questions, the comments, the, the Allison, just the kinds of issues you raised around how to communicate about this, uh, this process is are so important. So um, I'll just leave it at that. I note that um, all of this input has been helpful, not just, I'm sure, for the university and to the city, but also um, to the chamber staff team as we work to support this, pro this progress toward the annexation that we know that we want for the university's long-term uh, needs, but also for our community safety and to address critical housing issues. So um, I'll just leave it at that and, and just uh, enjoyed this presentation and conversation along with everybody else. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon.